every now and then a vehicle disappears. The media loves this because they can have 24 seven coverage about, Hey, this is the latest updates on this vehicle. Here's what we know. Here's where it went. Here's what people think. Here's a speculation surrounding the whereabouts of this vehicle. The people love it because when something goes missing, there's something mysterious and alluring about the, the mystery involved, right? Because you want to know what happened. You want that stream of information about, Hey, where did this thing go? Are the people okay? And if not, why? And it kind of fills this need that we have as people to be mystified. For those of you who don't know, a uh, submersible recently went missing, hence the intro. It was a submersible called the Titan. It was ironically named seeing as how it was tiny. It could seat five people at an elongated shape as opposed to the normal spherical shape of a uh, submersible. It was experimental, groundbreaking technology that had some flaws. Now by today, the day of recording, it has been announced that the Titan imploded. It was a catastrophic implosion. They found some debris that looked new and then they found the tail cone about 1600 feet away from the crash site of the Titanic, which is what they were uh, going to visit. So it is a tragedy. People died senselessly. That's never good. If you're hearing this and this is the first time you're hearing the story, you might be thinking, well, how did that happen? That's what I thought when I first heard about it. When it first went missing, I thought, how did that happen? And then once you look into it a little bit, it switches a little bit from how did that happen? to how did it take so long for this to happen? This conclusion was all but inevitable. There were five people aboard the Ocean Gate Titan, four innocent victims who were expecting to return home and live another day, and one Rush Stockton, the CEO of Ocean Gate, and the victim of his own apparent negligence. Now listen, I'm about to tell you a load of things that's going to make it sound like the only logical conclusion is why would I ever set foot upon this vehicle? Why would I ever even look at this submersible? I wouldn't come anywhere within a 10 mile radius of this submersible without, for, without first taking out an extensive lucrative life insurance policy on myself. And uh, yeah. That's a logical place to go with it, but I'm going to ask you to please not blame the victims in this scenario. Everybody lost their life. Families are grieving. Two of the four passengers were a man and his son. It's an extremely tragic scenario that should have never happened. Very avoidable. And in my opinion, it's the story of extreme negligence on behalf of the CEO slash engineer of the Titan submersible Rush Stockton himself, who was aboard. There was or is a company called Ocean Gate Expeditions. I don't know their current status, but they definitely existed at one point or they might still today. Very, very rich people would pay a small fortune to board the Titan submersible and go down 12 and a half thousand feet and see the wreckage of the RMS Titanic. Now, the Titanic, as I said, it rests 12 and a half thousand feet below sea level. For reference, the Empire State Building is 1,250 feet tall. So if you were to stack 10 Empire State Buildings from the wreck of the Titanic, theoretically, it would just be scraping the surface of the ocean. That's how deep it is which is insane. On Sunday, June 18th, 2023, five people boarded the Titan and departed on a routine trip to see the Titanic wreck. Now for the passengers, this was a moment they've been waiting for for a long time. They were probably excited. One ticket costs at least $250,000. So they probably uh, were really looking forward to this. And for Stockton Rush, this was just a routine day, another day at work, uh, just making that bread, I guess. The Titan submersible, is transported to the location of the shipwreck via another vessel called the Polar Prince. Goes on a little sled, uh, it's taken there, it's deployed, and then it, it you detach it from the sled, and then it goes down. The dive usually takes around eight hours. That's descending, visiting, and then ascending again. The total trip time is eight hours. But on Sunday, the Polar Prince lost contact with the Titan one hour and 45 minutes into the dive. Now, from what I understand, this isn't super abnormal to happen. Apparently, the Polar Prince loses contact with the Titan around this time, uh, 
rather frequently, I guess. And so alarm bells weren't going off yet. Nobody was sounding high alert. Nobody was, you know, rushing to alert the authorities that were missing a vessel. They said, ah, okay, well, we lost communication again. Let's wait and see if it comes back. It wasn't until later in the day on Sunday when contact hadn't been reestablished that they said, okay, something's wrong. The Titan is missing. Now, pretty quickly, this became a huge story. As we discussed, the media loves a missing vehicle. It, it is so much better than a crashed vehicle or an imploded vehicle or a stolen vehicle. This became pretty quickly an international effort to find and retrieve this vessel and to save the people inside it was what everybody was thinking about they have 96 hours of oxygen and we need to save them if possible and man the news cycle was cranking out the stories I saw so many headlines on the internet search mission underway for missing Titanic tour submersible live updates US Navy sending experts in deep ocean salvage system to aid in submersible search Titanic expedition firms CEO insisted mission was safe Ocean Gate's Wendy Rush is descended from the Titanic's Ida and Isidore Strauss. Missing Titanic submersible was built with NASA help. Okay, well, that, that's pretty cool. Missing Titanic submarine dead bolted with 17 bolts from the outside. I literally saw an article first that said, hey, this vessel was built with the help of NASA, right? Then I saw an article about how in order to get out of this submersible, you have to have somebody else open up the hatch for you because it's bolted on with 17 bolts. And I thought, I don't think I live in a reality where those two things can coexist. Let me explain. So in the history of NASA, the word Apollo exists. You've probably heard it before. It is the name given to all of the lunar missions where we were flying to and trying to land on the moon and eventually succeeding and then stopped. Basically, the whole reason they're called Apollo is because of Apollo 1. The mission was originally named AS-204, okay? And it was done before it started, unfortunately. During a test of sorts, a fire broke out inside of the ship and uh, it killed the astronauts inside. They couldn't open the door. It was what I think they call it a plug door. Basically, the difference in the pressure inside the cabin and outside the cabin made it so they couldn't even open it no matter how hard they tried. They unfortunately passed inside the vehicle. The crew of AS-204 wanted to call the mission Apollo, Apollo 1. After they passed, it was called Apollo 1. I, for one, find it very hard to believe that NASA would co-design a vessel, put their name on a vessel that they helped design in which the crew cannot get out no matter how hard they try. I just, I find that very difficult to believe. And in this situation, it makes it so that even if all the safety precautions worked and they floated up to the top at the first sign of emergency, they are still beholden to that 96 hours of reported life support inside, the 96 hours of oxygen they supposedly have because they can't get out to breathe the atmospheric air. They can't get out no matter how badly they want to because somebody else has to unbolt 17 bolts. I was pretty soon reading an article where NASA said, no, we didn't help design or manufacture the sub. I'm paraphrasing, but that's more or less what it said. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Uh, that along with another myriad of other issues. Speaking of other issues, in 2018, a guy called David Lockridge, a former employee of Ocean Gate and former submersible pilot, filed a lawsuit against the company, alleging that, quote, the customers were being exposed to a potential extreme danger in an experimental submersible due to Ocean Gate's refusal to conduct critical, non-destructive testing of the experimental design of the hull. The suit was settled outside of court. Uh, for a unspecified amount. Apparently, I, I can't find the dollar amount anywhere. So yeah, cool. In response, Mr. Rush said, quote, industry standards are stifling innovation. 
What a guy. With that information in mind, take a listen to what David Pogue from CBS Sunday Morning says about uh, the waiver he had to sign to even go on his expedition. An experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Link to the full videos in the description. I highly recommend that you give it a watch because it's kind of illuminating as to what exactly is going on on this ship, this submersible. So from the way that I see it, he's cutting corners and cutting costs every chance he gets. I find it very interesting that in the interview with David Pogue from CBS Sunday Morning, he says that he doesn't really make any profit from these expeditions from Ocean Gate. Are you making money on this operation? Uh, no. <laughs> but then he's quoted as saying that profit is the only way to get things done in the world and that this isn't for military. This isn't for like great scientific value. This is for profit. So I don't know how those two things can exist. But it's very clear to me that he was cutting costs everywhere he can, in my opinion. And we're going to outline that a little further as we go. Now, from what I understand, Stockton Rush bragged about breaking the rules to build the Titan. He purposefully refused to have any regulatory body come and examine and, and inspect and certify the ship. He said the industry was, quote, obscenely safe. He told the reporter that at some point safety is just pure waste. And then in the interview with David Pogue, Stockton Rush said that he got the handle in his uh, in his submersible from Camping World and kind of bragged about that. And I, and I guess that's fine, you know, at the end of the day, I guess it's fine to get parts from Camping World, but I don't think that if I'm paying a quarter million dollars to go on your expedition that I necessarily want to know that you bought the handle at Camping World. I want to feel like, you know, engineers purpose built this thing so that you could, you know, take it with the, the most uh, effective design possible. That's what I want to feel like. I don't want to feel like you got it on the clearance rack at the fucking camping world. A lot of articles are calling this a submersible built with off the shelf parts. And I don't know if that's a label that he gave it, but that's a label that definitely feels fitting. David Pogue in, the, in that interview even said that it kind of feels like there's an element of MacGyveriness that went into it. And uh, yeah, I I don't know. Maybe Stockton like uses that to fuel his marketing. This is an experimental craft. You're on the cutting edge of experimentation and innovation and that industry standard is trying to stifle with all its might. Everyone's against this innovation. And I just feel like it's kind of a negative selling point because who wants to spend all this money to go into a submersible that can be described as having been built with off-the-shelf parts. What, this? Yeah, it's uh, 40 grand. What do you mean that's too much? Would it make you feel better if I told you I bought this neck at Walmart? The body of this is made out of old pallets. Where are you going? Oh, this? Yeah, it's probably three, four hundred bucks. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy actually. This isn't a real coconut. I took one of those uh, styrofoam balls you can get at Hobby Lobby, hollowed that out, put this cardboard on top, uh, nailed a bunch of old toothpicks together. It's held together by nails and hot glue. Where are you going? That doesn't increase the value. Speaking of guitars, I have a lot of experience, a few years experience working in a guitar repair, uh, guitar store, guitar repair shop, that kind of thing. And it's kind of crazy to me that the hull of this thing is made out of carbon fiber because in my experience, uh, I've seen a couple of carbon fiber guitar necks that have broken. And they don't just like break the way wooden necks do. They don't just kind of snap and you've got all the pieces and then you can put them together. Or maybe there's a crack that you just put some glue in and seal it up. They kind of, they break and then they flake out. And it's kind of like a weird shattery thing that they do. I don't think I've ever seen a cracked carbon fiber neck. And if I did, it probably wouldn't be cracked for long. So uh, whenever I heard that this hull was partially made of carbon fiber, I was like, oh God, how's that going to go? And uh, we unfortunately see how it goes. There's a great video from this guy over at uh, Subbrief. 
He did a fantastic video about it about a week ago. He outlined a lot of the issues specifically concerning carbon fiber that I kind of assumed was the case because of my experience with guitars. He's a sub guy and basically says, yeah, it, it would shatter. It wouldn't crack. That would be a huge concern. Basically, he said, carbon fiber is great till it's not. And uh, uh, this is a till it's not situation. Another major issue I had with this whole story is the fact that they were using a wireless Logitech Xbox style controller to pilot the craft. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of military vehicles that use video game controllers, specifically Xbox, to pilot their stuff. It's, it's cool because Xbox is owned by Microsoft and their controllers are compatible with Microsoft computers. So you get your controller, you plug into the computer, it's already ready to go. You know, you can kind of just um, switch them out if you need to. It's always going to work. You know, with a PlayStation controller, you might need a third party software, that kind of thing. This was piloted with a wireless controller, um, and that's a problem because these things, they run out of battery, dude. They just do. Whenever you plug a controller in, you don't have to charge it. You don't have to have batteries for it. It's just ready to go all the time. It's passive electronics. Once you introduce a wireless component, you have to charge that shit. Does he have extra controllers laying around? I don't know. Does he have extra batteries for his one controller? Who knows? He likes the convenience of it so he can pass it around as submersible and whoever can go ahead and control it. And, and that's fine, I guess. Can't you also pass around a wired controller? I get the feeling that he looked on Amazon one day and was like, oh, you know what? The one with the wires, $5 more, the wireless one's on clearance. So I'm just going to go ahead and get that one, even though, uh, you know, the safety of my passengers is kind of at, in play here. Another major issue I have with the wireless controller thing is once you go that deep, I feel like the signals might get interfered with. Like, you know, when it's raining and stuff doesn't connect quite as well, like I'm sure... 12.5 thousand feet under the surface, uh, the Bluetooth connection might not be so hot. I, I don't know if that's a thing that happens, but I feel like it might be. For me, when I'm uh, recording music, I kind of refuse to use Bluetooth anything because the connection itself is so slow that uh, it really messes with my ability to play. And I feel like if I was piloting a craft, I might not want a Bluetooth thing. I might want a wired thing for all of those reasons. I just, there's really no reason to have it be wireless. Now it is possible that he was u utilizing a USB port on this controller and plugging it in. I haven't researched the controller itself. I don't know if that's a possibility, benefit of the doubt, but in the video, he specifically touts that it's a wireless controller. I also really like the super long nipples that he put on it. He's got little nipples on this controller that come out like this. And I don't know if that like helps you more precisely, precisely move the analog stick, but that's pretty cool, <laughs> I guess. Another glaring issue I have with this whole situation, and it's not a unique take here, is the fact that he refused pretty much outright to hire experienced submariners, experts in the field. He's got all this cutting edge technology, all this innovative experimental design, and not a single submarine expert on the crew. He uh, prides himself, or prided himself, uh, rest in peace, on only hiring new grads because it's inspirational for the next generation of submariners, right? You don't want a bunch of 50 year old white dudes when you're 20 years old and looking for a career. That's not going to, uh, this is not going to inspire you, I guess. Um, and yeah, that's a cool story, but you know what else is different between a brand new graduate and a 50 year old white dude expert is the pay rate. Last time I worked in a place where uh, a guy in charge kind of bragged about, hey, I don't hire experienced nurses. I hire the new nurses. You know what immediately followed? It wasn't because it's so inspirational. It was new nurses don't know what they're worth. Literally 
That's what he said. And with all the other places, this guy was cutting costs and cutting corners, bragging about profits while saying that he doesn't make any. It's hard to deny that that might be a factor in who he's hiring. That for me is exactly what it was. There's, there's one reason you would only hire new grads and that's because they're cheaper. If you were doing it to be inspirational, you would have two or three experts and the rest be new grads. And not only is it inspirational, you've got this position where new grads can hire into and learn from the best in the field. Another thing though is I read a couple of reports where people would speak up about how dangerous that they thought the submersible was and how uh, Rush Stockton maybe didn't exactly know what he was doing and he fired them for speaking out. So maybe, uh, maybe that's part of it too. Maybe his ego was too fragile to, uh, to allow experts in the field tell him that what he's doing wasn't right. So that brings us to the other day when my wife sent me a text saying, Hey, they found new debris. They think it may have imploded. And then a few hours later, I saw a story that said, yeah, they found the tail cone. It imploded. And then a couple hours later, there was a story that was circulating that said, hey, yeah, the Navy kind of knew it imploded the whole time, but you know, you have to do the whole search anyway. And I saw a bunch of people talking about how like the Navy should have spoken up or the Coast Guard or whoever should have spoken up and said, yeah, it imploded. <laughs> Everybody don't come search for it. And I think that's kind of goofy because one, like, yeah, there was evidence of an implosion. It could have also been just a loud noise. Also, uh, for as long as there may be air in the vessel, it's good to look for it unless you find actual evidence that it's no longer there because you don't want to stop looking and then leave these people to one of the longest, most excruciating deaths that you could imagine. The 96 hours of life support, from what I understand, was a pretty generous amount. It's what they found on the website. And uh, once again, in Subbrief's video, he mentioned that maybe the testing hadn't been done to come up with that number. And it was kind of just kind of pulled out of the guy's ass. Yeah, maybe. But the reason that they were looking for the full 96 hours is because if it is that much life support, we're going to find them alive. Every chance we get, we're going to find them alive. And if we don't, at least we didn't give up because we thought it had less air than it did. You know, at least we didn't just give up because we thought it imploded. At this point, really the only solace we can take in the whole thing is at least it wasn't a long drawn out death. At least they probably died very quickly maybe even before they knew they were about to die. It's a crazy story. In my opinion, once again, loads of negligence took taking place, purposefully avoiding industry standard and then bragging about it. It's insane. At the end of the day, the people getting up on board, they signed a waiver with the word death on it multiple times. Now a waiver doesn't cover everything, you know? If you sign a waiver coming to my house and it says that you might die in my house, and then you die in my house, it doesn't necessarily mean that I can't be sued from it. Like there's, there's a lot of weird legalities that go into place with waivers. So just a heads up, I see a lot of waiver talk and comments on videos. So figured I'd go ahead and address that right here. Let me know what you thought. Like, comment, subscribe. That's about it. Later. I can't wait for the internet historian video about this in like three years. Maybe he'll let me cameo.